All right, Council Member Cindy Bass, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. All right. Uh, so the first thing I'd like to ask you about before we jump into what's happening now on Council and what will be happening. Uh, two weeks ago on the show, we ran a story about municipalities purchasing their citizens' medical debt and mm -hmm. forgiving it. Um, you know, in your role as chair of the health committee, is this something that you find as an interesting concept and, and maybe worth further study? Well, I think that um, this is something certainly worthy of further conversation and um, uh, looking into what we can do always to make the lives of our citizens here in Philadelphia, uh, you know, a little bit easier, a little bit better. What can we do to, you know, have a, a more positive impact? And I do think that um, just looking and considering the idea of uh, removing any um, uh, medical debt, particularly in certain communities, because we know that um, you know, for example, gun violence and and the trauma and uh, um, the physical. Um, I'm talking about mental and physical. Um, you know, medical debt that would be a, a accumulated from a, you know a gunshot victim um, or their family. Uh, I, I think that that's something that we should definitely be looking into. How can we remove that medical debt? Um, other things such as I would say, you know, um, high blood pressure, diabetes, things of this nature, which again, we know affects particular communities that have been underserved, um, that have really not had the quality of medical care um, because they haven't had the medical insurance. They haven't had access to quality medical insurance that will provide them with a level of care that you get with a private uh, provider. So I think that that's something that would, would uh, definitely be uh, helpful to our citizenry and we should be looking into. Okay. Um, so looking ahead a little bit, you know, the, the spring council session is about to begin. What are your major goals for this upcoming session? Well, one of the things that we're definitely looking into is what can we do about the increase in real estate assessments? We feel that, or I feel that, uh, you know, some of the actions taken by the city and the administration have really undercut uh, 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 ensuring that people are, are um, able to purchase homes and able to stay in their homes. And so uh, this is something that needs to be looked further into in terms of where what areas were taxed, um, why these valuations and how they arrived at these valuations, which are still all over the place. When we did the AVI actual value initiative, uh, actual value initiative several years ago, I think it was 2013 or 2014, the idea and the goal was to really make sure that your property value just about matched up with your appraisal value. And what we see here is that, that that's still not the case. We still don't have it right. And this has been much more complicated than it really needs to be, in my opinion. It doesn't have to be so hard. Right. It doesn't have to be so difficult. We can figure this out. And I think that we need to figure it out because it's really unfair that you're going to say my home is valued at X. And meanwhile, I cannot go and get a mortgage for X. I cannot sell my home for X. I cannot uh, ladder, uh, you know, uh, leverage uh, any collateral, any equity in my home um, based on the number that you gave me. So we really need to have um, some sort of, a, a, you know, information in terms of how you arrive at this figure. So um, that's our number one priority is working on real estate tax assessments and making sure that people are able to keep their homes because we see that there's a great amount of displacement and gentrification happening in the city of Philadelphia. We know that um, we have a housing crisis, particularly a low and moderate income housing crisis. There's almost nowhere to purchase a unit uh, or to purchase a unit that is within a reasonable amount um, under the $100,000, $250,000 mark. Um, and uh, as a result of uh, a lot of landlords now sort of cashing in and either selling the properties that they were once renting or um, increasing their rents directly, uh, you know, you have a large population that were previously very stable in their home situation and their living situation. Uh, and now these people are very much uh, unstable. So, uh, you know, how do we rectify that? How do we fix that? That the the uh, assessments is probably the number one thing we've gotten emails and concerns about for any issue um, that we've mm -hmm. covered. Um, so, you know, spring also means budget season. So very generally, um, how do you approach the budget? Because we're, we're talking about a, a huge undertaking here. How do you get started on that? And what are some of the things that you look for as the, as the process goes on? 
Well, we really want to sit down and meet with each department and see what their asks are, uh, find out who's trying to do what. And so that's really where the budget process begins with us. We want to know uh, what departments are trying something new, something different, something that's going to be interesting that can help our constituents. Um, and there, believe it or not, there always are um, you know, really good nuggets of information when you sit down and you meet directly with each department during the budget, budget season or b before the budget season actually starts, they usually come around. So they can sort of uh, uh, give us an indication of what they're working on and how it's going to benefit the residents of the 8th Council District and the residents of the city of Philadelphia. Um, so that's something we're going to be play paying uh, very close attention to. Um, and beyond that, you, you know, really going through and seeing um, you know, what's changed from department to department uh, in the budget books? You know, has there been any dramatic increase uh, in any of the categories and staffing and supplies and contracts and this, that, the other thing? Has there been any significant decrease in any of these matters? So, you know, these are all things that, uh, uh, you know, we're going to be looking at. And, you know, it it seems to me, because I've seen the actual printed budget books, which are, uh, I have a two-year-old. Yeah. Massive. Of the yeah, it, it's unbelievable. Um, so so it, is it more of a you're trying to look at everything or do you say, OK, you know, we can't do everything all the time. We're going to pick a couple of things. W what is that like for you when you when you finally get that budget? How do you start to say, well, you know, I'm, I'm looking at this or we're going to try to do everything we can? Well, you know, looking at the budget books, it, it varies from year to year. And we always try to take, I, I'm just going to be honest with you, we always try to take a different and new approach to it because, again, it's, it's, it's a massive document. And so there's no one right way to do it. Uh, so we, you know, again, we, we talk to the department heads. Uh, we find out exactly what they are planning. Uh, we do our own scanning of each department and look to see of any, um, you know, large discrepancies from the previous years. And, uh, you know, we make a determination as to, you know, where we're going to focus in on if, if something doesn't look right or if something needs more attention or if there's something, for, for example, a pressing need that we know needs to be addressed. So, for example, um, just going back to our previous question on housing and, and uh, being able to purchase homes in the city, we know that there has been or there seems to have been a significant increase in the homeless population in Philadelphia or the uh, population of Philadelphians who are in un unstable housing conditions. And so um, that's the department, obviously, that we're going to want to pay attention to, the Office of Housing, the Office of um, uh, uh, Homelessness and Emergency, ho uh, emergency Housing. Um, those are all departments that we're going to be paying particular attention to to see exactly what they're doing. Another department um, that we want to pay attention to, which is not a city department, but still comes because they have a budget request, is SEPTA. Um, there's a lot of concerns about safety on SEPTA. There's also a lot of homelessness happening within the SEPTA system right now. And so that's a department that we're going to be paying attention to. And also, as they talk about this bus revolution, we want to have some sense of, um, you know, uh, how is this going to affect uh, you know, the low to moderate income uh, neighborhoods. And so while you're talking about expanding your transit uh, out to King of Prussia, which would um, enable you to attract more uh, affluent, um, uh, you know, middle class, upper middle class, uh, you know, uh, residents not of color, uh, but at the same time, you're, it sounds like you want to cut back on services in our neighborhoods, which primarily affect people of color who are of uh, less means. And so that's something that is, has really attracted my attention. And I have uh, plan to have a lot to say about that. Well, that's good. We, we I think the second most thing we've received comments about is the, is the SEPTA issues and bus resolution. Yeah. So yeah. It's, it's good to hear that you're that's hot. Yeah. So one of the added elements to this year's budget cycle is, is you know, some surplus funds that maybe won't some people weren't expecting, maybe some people were. Do, do you want to see some of those funds be spent uh, in this budget cycle? And if so, where would you like to see that kind of focus? Well, I think um, just going back to my number one priority in housing, mm -hmm. I think the city of Philadelphia really has en enough money to do whatever it needs to do 
Um, I think that uh, there's a lot of waste. There's a lot of mismanagement. There's a lot of inefficiencies that really could just be um, addressed. I'm hopeful with the next administration that that's something that they intend to really look at, uh, ways to make Philadelphia more efficient so that we um, have even more money that we can spend, uh, you know, in, in areas that are much needed. But just going back to your question, um, again, housing is something that's critically important. You cannot have, you cannot build a life for yourself if you don't have a stable foundation. And so a stable foundation really does begin with having access to housing and not just any old housing, but some quality housing. Um, it's it's not something that should just be, um, uh, you know, you're lucky if you get it. it. It really is a human right. And so I think that that's the attitude in which the city of Philadelphia should uh, proceed. I think that, so, and just as an example, I know that we've had this um, different examples of what the city could do uh, around housing. As an example, the townhomes at 40th and Market, um, the UC townhomes, uh, it's my opinion that when the property owner decided not to con continue to uh, you know, have the property, uh, have the agreement with HUD to make this a low income uh, housing um, site and he decided to cash in, which is absolutely his right to do, but at the same time, it's the responsibility of the city um, to ensure that those people aren't displaced. And so, um, it seems that, you know, they were like everyone in the, in the, uh, in the complex was displaced. Um, you know, they were given vouchers and told to go find something in a housing market that a voucher is absolutely useless, uh, of mm -hmm. the size that they receive. Um, and unless you're paying the market rate, which was between 1500 and $2,000 a month right now, you know, for even a one bedroom apartment, you're not going to be able to house those folks. You're not going to be able to put them in the, the quality of housing that they really deserve as citizens of Philadelphia. So um, this is something that we need to have, again, more, more discussion and conversation on. But I think excess, uh, excess funds could have been used to address uh, the, the growing need uh, and the housing insecurity uh, issue that we face in Philadelphia. And, and you know, that stable housing piece it is the number one issue that leads to poverty. Mm -hmm. And it's just, you know, it, 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 it makes too much sense. That's where we should be yeah. headed. Well, well um, I'd like to bring in Denise Clay Murray here on Philadelphia Home Monitor. Thank, Thank you, Larry. And, and hi, Councilwoman, how are you? I'm great, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. I, I guess my first question for you is, in, when you look at your district, mm -hmm. it's where a lot of nicer homes are, a lot of bigger homes, some places that were estates. And you have people who are, of course, looking at their tax assessment and saying, are you kidding me? Mm -hmm. um, are, do you, have you been doing anything to kind of like help them offset that? I mean, connecting them with services? Absolutely. So when these, you know, when, when uh, we were made aware that um, these assessments were going to be coming, and then when they started to hit and the appeals process was a very short window, and the Office of Property Assessment was saying that they didn't have enough envelopes, which is absolutely ridiculous, because uh, everybody's heard of Staples and Office Max. So, you know, it's just it's just really, really uh, ridiculous. But we opened our office up uh, in the evenings and on weekends so that people could actually come in and speak with someone and help uh, file their appeals. And so we have some areas with really big stately homes, but we have most of our 8th district area uh, is not. It's row homes, it's neighborhoods, it's people who are struggling day to day to make it. It's neighborhoods like uh, North Philadelphia, Nice Town, Tioga, Alney, Logan, uh, Germantown, Mount Airy, um, and, and, and Chestnut Hill. But for the most part, most of those neighborhoods, people are really just trying to make it. And when you send someone a tax assessment who's been you know, struggling with an $800 bill in Tioga, and you send them an assessment saying, your new assessment is uh, $5,000 a year, um, you know, it's a, it, listen, it's enough to, to uh, you know, just uh, really get some people to, to uh, feel like they, they're going to throw in the towel, you know, that they just can't fight, you know, what's happening. Already, it's likely that they're fighting to, you know, keep their house together, that the maintenance, the repairs, the this, the that, you know, um, you all know that in, say, Tioga and Nice Town, we have a lot of those very stately um, three-story brownstone row homes. And, you know, people really struggle to keep them 
um, in the manner and condition uh, in which, you know, that, that, they're, that they're meant to be kept. So, um, you know, adding on top of that and adding on top of the daily stresses already in someone's life, um, you know, we're not helping the situation. We're not helping at all. And we know good and doggone well that that property assessment is way over assessment. Okay. Sorry. Now, about that. that's okay. <laughs> now, the Germantown YMCA mm -hmm. uh, ha has been an issue for a minute in terms of what to do with it and how to yes. uh, and how to fix it. Where does that stand now? We're having conversations with the Redevelopment Authority, with PRA, uh, the uh, well Pennsylvania Philadelphia Redevelopment Authority, um, but we're having conversations with them about the Germantown uh, Y and um, what's going to happen next. And so, as you may remember, um, KBK was the entity that was uh, selected by PRA um, to be able to come in and develop this property and to, um, you know, have ownership of this property. Um, PRA gave the Germantown Y, uh, uh, well, the people who had interest, which is KBK Enterprises, uh, PRA gave them what is, in my opinion, misinformation and basically gave them the runaround, if, if I'm going to be quite frank. They were told to go look for tax credits, um, historic tax credits, which were mandatory, um, which uh, they were unable to receive. And after two, two and a half years, uh, when they were told they were unable to receive and they went back to PRA, they were told, oh, well, it wasn't mandatory. It was optional. But in writing, you said it was mandatory. You said it was a requirement. And so the, the, there's this and there's other examples that we have in which PRA really did give this organization the runaround. And, um, you know, there are other development projects in my district in which people have had options on land for a much longer time. And I feel like there, you know, like this is something that uh, really needs to be looked into because it feels as if, and I, this is probably going to get me in trouble. This is why I'm always in trouble. But it feels as if, if you are connected and if you have um, uh, the, the hookup, so to speak, then the rules are different for you. And so my question is, why are the rules different for one developer that's been sitting on a plot of land for a very long time? You know, why are the rules different for them? And they're in the 8th District versus KBK, which was fighting through a pandemic, fighting through misinformation, fighting through all kinds of in inaccuracies provided by PRA, which first of all said that uh, they were that that a um, another developer was uh, listed higher in the scoring to to obtain this property than PRA and they were listed higher as a minority, which they were not, uh, and a whole bunch of other things that were included in that scoring sheet, which PRA has still failed to uh, help us understand how they arrived at that decision. And, uh, you know, there it's, it's a whole lot of mess is what I'm going to tell you. It's a whole lot of mess. So um, I think that this is something that should be further looked into. I did reach out to the former controller before she left to run for mayor and ask her to look further into this. I don't know that they're looking into this, but I certainly hope that whoever the next controller is uh, certainly will be looking into it. Okay. Now, speaking of the mayor's race, uh -huh. um, initially, you your name was one of the hat names that was thrown into the hat for people who were thinking about making the run. Mm -hmm. Is that still something you're considering, or are you like I'm just gonna you know be here on council and try to you know do what I can here? I have some other interests in council leadership. Mm -hmm. Okay. So well, it, it depends on on what happens and within council, but. Um, assuming that, you know, maybe maybe there might be some departures or changes or whatever, um, that there might be some other opportunities. So I intend to stay in council. Okay. And because this is an election year and we can't because get around of, it. Say again? Yes, because this is an election year and we can't get around it. If, if city, city council doesn't necessarily conduct itself like Congress where like very little gets done in an election year, but how do you manage to, 
you know, do what you need to do for the citizens of Philadelphia while running your campaign, because all of you are also up for election. Well, you know what, it's, it's, it's not so hard because I have a great office staff that can keep the train running, you know, um, there's, you know, I don't have to be the only conductor, uh, you know, I've got a great team of folks who uh, know what our mission is. Our mission is to serve the people of the 8th Council District and really all of Philadelphia. So, um, you know, we have a great uh, apparatus in place and it will run through election cycles. And this is not our first election cycle. Uh, so, uh, you know, the trains will keep running. Things will be uh, uh, addressed. People will be served. And we will also be able to do our campaign work as necessary. Now, as you mentioned, this is since your first election cycle, but you have colleagues for whom it is. Yes. Have you given them any advice about how to handle that? Well, you know what? I've been helpful to uh, all of my colleagues, particularly those who are, uh, you know, first timers. Um, some of them have been around before people like Kathy Gilmore Richardson. Listen, Kathy worked for Blondell. She knows what to do. She knows how to, she's been through election cycles uh, and working for the councilwoman. And now she's the councilwoman. And so I have no doubt that she'll know what to do. Um, also, you have Isaiah Thomas, who's been um, you know, around for a long time, uh, maybe not in council, but he's certainly been uh, engaged in politics for a, a very long time. So he'll, he's got a great amount of familiarity. Uh, and then you have Jimmy Harity. And uh, Jimmy has been around for forever since I've started. Uh, I've known Jimmy Harity, and he's been out here hustling and grinding and working for former Mayor Street and also for State Senator Sharif Street. So I know he knows what to do. So I'm certainly there to be as helpful as I possibly can. Uh, you know, and to our other newcomers, Ketsi Lazada and uh, Anthony Phillips, and um, I think that's I think oh, and Sharon Vaughn, who uh, Sharon's not running for re-election. But, uh, you know, like we've got um, some really good people who have good experience and know-how and knowledge. So, uh, listen, they're going to be able to hold their own. They're going to be fine. Okay. And just one last question. Sure. Relish Restaurant uh, is closing. I know. And, and I know that that's not specifically your district, but it is the Northwest. And it was, you know, a place where people, you know, went and ate and, and, and yeah. it, was, it was an economic generator. How... Does losing something like that impact that area? And are all of you who actually, you know, are whose district this overlaps, yeah. are you all talking about what to do next here? So I can tell you when I heard the news, it was, um, you know, I don't want to say devastating, but in some ways it, it was um, because it's a setback. It, you know, it's hard to find, you know, the the that white tablecloth, um, you know, restaurant in our neighborhoods, in, in black and brown neighborhoods. It, they're hard to find. And so um, when this well-known, well-regarded establishment that everything from people around the corner to presidents have been to, um, you, you know, you don't want to lose it. You, you don't want to lose it. As soon as I heard I did reach out to uh, some folks, uh, you know, who, who I work with um, politically, who are elected officials, um, to ask them if they thought they could bring some resources to the table, particularly state resources. I'm not going, you know, call them out, but um, you know, shout out to a couple state senators that I reached out to um, to ask them if, is there some kind of package or something that could be put together, financial package. Um, that could help them if if that is doable. So um, I, you know, I I don't know um, what the next steps are. Um, my first wish would be to have Relish remain uh, in place to continue to serve, to continue to be the meeting place that it has been for so very long. Um, so we will see. We will see. Okay, thank you. And and thank you for joining us. And I'm going to take it back to Larry McGlynn, our co-host. And you're listening to Hall Monitor on WPPM 106.5. Thank you, Denise. And, and Council Member, I just have one last question for you. Sure. You And this is a little bit of a civics lesson, maybe, for, for, for our audience. Um, you are the majority yeah. deputy whip. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about that, what, what that is, and, and how you, you uh, use that role? 
Well, the majority deputy whip is a position that, uh, well, let me just explain the whip is basically it's it's from a term of basically whipping up votes, of, of basically securing votes, particularly for controversial bills. We haven't had any really controversial, you know, bills that have, you know, divided us or that were, um, you know, that, that there was uh, concern or worry about them uh, actually getting through. So uh, my, my uh, skills uh, have, uh, you know, yet to be uh, fully utilized in that department, but I'm looking forward to being uh, able to be uh, used to uh, come up with votes, uh, make sure that we talk to members, uh, engage them, include them, uh, and really get the votes that are necessary for crucial crucial pieces of legislation that need to get passed. So uh, I, I work uh, with Mark Squilla, who is the uh, uh, whip, and I'm the deputy whip. And so uh, this is an exciting time uh, for me to be able to have this position and to be able to help uh, help my colleagues to get important pieces of legislation passed. All right. Well, Council Member Cindy Bass, thank you so much for joining us. Yes, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for having me. It's my pleasure.